This morning we're going to talk about American gods. What inspired this message? Sometimes I said, how do you come up with these things? Well, I was reading an article. There's a show coming out on, um, I think it's on the Stars Network. I actually did see a trailer on it. It's called American Gods. I don't recommend the show from the trailer. The trailer alone has so much violence in it that I'm going, yeah, this is probably not a show you want to watch. But I was reading about what the show is all about, and I thought it was really interesting. The idea behind American Gods is that in America, with all these immigrants that have come into America, they brought with them the gods from, from um, the myths and legends of the past. Like the Greek gods and the Roman gods have all been brought into America, and they've been hiding in the background. And now in this show, they're starting to come to the forefront. They're real gods. And not only that, but other new gods have been created in America. And one of the gods created in America is called Media. <laughs> in the story. And I thought, man, that's interesting. So I kind of took that and I went from there. And I'm going to look at, are there other gods in America? I'm going to look at some of the, the Greek gods and how they relate to what we're worshiping in America today and what we shouldn't be worshiping in America. Exodus 23 says, You shall have no other gods before me. How many have ever really thought about that verse? First commandment. If you're not to have other gods before God, then there must be other gods. Little g. <laughs> it's logic, right? How can you worship other gods if they're not other gods? They're little g gods. Um... A lot of people don't understand in the, in, in the Hebrew language, the word that's used there for God is Elohim. Elohim in context in referring to God Almighty is singular. It's, I mean, it's singular. It's not pointing to a lot of gods. But the, the word Elohim can also be plural referring to a lot of gods. What Elohim really refers to are spiritual beings. So it's saying that God who is the Almighty, the Creator of everything, He is Spirit, so he's, He is Elohim. But there are also other gods who are Elohim. We would call angels or other beings, not all beings. You know, some say that angels means messengers, so not all what we see in the Bible we call angels are necessarily angels. They're spiritual beings that inhabit the spiritual realm. So they're referred to as little g gods you'll see in your Bible. There's a little g, that's what it's referring to. There's a big g referring to God the Father. Another interesting verse is Psalm 82.1. It says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Has anybody thought about that verse? This saying that God is standing in a congregation and he's judging among gods. God has a council. And there are other verses you can pull out scripture that show that there is a heavenly council. He created mankind to be part of that council. In the Garden of Eden. But what happened? Man sinned, was kicked out of the garden, was kicked out of the presence of God. We are no longer part of his counsel. Does God need a counsel to make decisions? No. But he chooses to have a counsel. See, it's not that he needs a counsel. And there's another verse that in, uh, I think it's in the book of Kings, where it talks about that God speaks to the counsel on how to judge a particular king. And the counsel comes up with the plan. So, he listens to the council, but he doesn't need the council. It's by choice that he has a council. Psalm 135, 15 to 8 says, The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. So the idols that they worship were the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. See, people throughout history have created idols that they worship. Now, the idols in the Old Testament, the idea behind the idol is those that built an idol, they didn't really believe that that idol was God, their God. They believed that that idol was a way to capture the presence of their God and, and get his attention. A representation, sorry. Right, very good. Representation, But actually, it, it, it went beyond a little bit beyond a representation. It was a way to capture their God's presence so that they could give offerings and things. That's what idols were. But it tells us that idols were nothing but things they couldn't see, things they couldn't hear. What's interesting about idols 
is if you read in the scripture, they couldn't stand before God. They fell over. This is um, just from a little article on this. It says, if American gods can teach us anything, that's the, the series, it's that true worship is found in what we sacrifice to. Work, sports, fashion, technology, each of these things can become an idol based on how much time and money we give to them. Have you ever skipped Bible study because your favorite show was on that night? Did you refuse the offering plate one day because you needed money for those new shoes? How many of us attend church on Sunday mornings and spend the entire service imagining a football game? The truth is, we're all guilty of idolatry in some form or another. We need to be honest with ourselves, all of us. I, I, we're all, you know, television is way too much of my time. I spend a lot of time reading, but I spend too much time watching TV. You know, I mean, and even reading can be an idol too, you know. There's so many things that take our attention away from God. When we invest more of our time, money, or attention in something other than Christ, we are creating a new God for us to worship. Being a Christian means giving our heart fully to Jesus as the exclusion of all else. Our lives should represent and reflect the love, grace, and forgiveness God has shown to us, while our worship should be seen in everyday actions, not just Sunday morning gatherings. So it should be in all ask, and then the question, what do you worship? We need to ask ourselves, what do we worship? Now, Sunday morning gatherings aren't the only place where we should come together to worship God, but we should come together. So many people try to tell me I don't need to be in church because I can worship God at home. But they're not at home worshiping God. Guarantee them when knocked on their door, they're not there on their knees with their Bible open worshiping. And I've said this before, people say I can worship God out in the wilderness, out on the mountain. I guarantee today, right now, if you go climb any of the mountains around town, you're not going to find anybody up on the mountain worshiping. It's just an excuse. Sure, you could worship God that way, but are you? Charles Spurgeon once said, false gods patiently endure the existence of other false gods. Dagon can stand with Bel, and Bel with Ashtaroth. These are all false gods in the Old Testament. How should stone and wood and silver be moved to indignation? But because God is the only living and true God, Dagon must fall before his ark, Bel must be broken, and Ashtoreth must be consumed with fire. And I put the verses there to tell about where that happened. Just one of them, you know the story of the god Dagon. They had stolen the Ark of the Covenant. They put the Ark of the Covenant next to the god Dagon. And when they came back the next day, god Dag the god Dagon was flat on his face. The idol had fallen over. They stood it back up, did it again. Got to the point and said that the, the priests of Dagon would not even walk in that threshing floor anymore because of God Almighty. The false god couldn't even stand in the presence of the true God. But you can read if you, you got those more no. other stories about Bell being broken and the Asheroth being consumed with fire. That's where... Um, I believe it was Elisha called down fire from heaven, consumed the, the God Ashtaroth. Yeah, mm -hmm. So we're going to look at some of the gods that might be being worshipped in America today. Hippiatus, the Greek god of blacksmiths, craftsmen, artisans, sculptures, metal, metallurgy, fire, and volcano. What do we know this god as today in America? This is the god of technology. In the book of Enoch, we find there's also mention of who I believe this actual God was. The, the spirit, spiritual being behind this God was Azazel, who taught men to make swords, knives, shields, and armor from the metals of the earth. If you stick with us in the morning study on Enoch, you'll see a number of gods are mentioned in what they taught men, forbidden knowledge. And this was, technology was attributed to Azazel. Some of us are worshiping iGod, your iPads, your technology, your phones. Are, are they consuming you, taking more away from you than you're giving to God? It says iGod, now available in tablet form. It's a funny joke. <laughs> There's some truth behind it. 
Here is a line of people waiting to get the new iPhone. You know, I'd love to see a line like this of people waiting to get into church. Amen. You know, but when I thought about that, I thought, you know, I was going to say, I never see a line waiting to get into church. But that wouldn't be true because every morning on Sunday when we get here, there is a line. One Amen. person. Amen. <laughs> but Patty is always there waiting for us, waiting to get into church. So I do have a line. <laughs> and I thank her for that. Yes. But you never see huge lines waiting to get in on Sunday morning. They're usually with people that should be in church or somewhere else in line. Because we worship our technology. Technology in and of itself is not a bad thing. I'm using technology right now. Not a bad thing. Internet in and of itself, not a bad thing. There's a lot of bad stuff on there. But you as a Christian should know how to stay away from it. But technology can be a God. When it begins to consume you. Do you find yourself checking your text messages in the middle of the sermon at church? Well, maybe your attention's on the wrong God. Your attention should be on the God of heaven. The God that is being spoken about. There's Leonard. He's got his phone up there. Thank you, Leonard, for that visual. <laughs> Media calculated average time spent per day on YouTube. This is interesting. Average time people spend on YouTube is 40 minutes a day, 35 minutes a day on Facebook, 25 minutes a day on Snapchat, 15 minutes a day on Instagram, and Twitter one. And projecting those figures out over a lifetime, arriving at a total of five years and four months that people are spending on their technology. Social media use Trail when watching television at seven years and eight months it spent watching TV. And it came in well ahead of eating and drinking, grooming, socializing, and the necessary evil of doing laundry. <laughs> People spend more time with their technology, their TV, TV than doing these things that you shouldn't have to do. You, you know, you got to eat, you got to drink, should do laundry, but much more time is being spent on our technology. I would be sad to calculate how much time people are spending in church. Doesn't compare. Lucky to get you for one hour a week. Then there's Dionysus, the god of the great harvest, winemaking and wine and theater. This is the god of entertainment today. Could be the god of media. People love entertainment. They love going to the movies. They love watching TV. But back in the days of the Greek, at least they called it a god. And they had a statue. When you went to the theater, you gave your offering to Dionysus, and then you went in and watched the theater. <laughs> Today we do it without even thinking about it, but it is a god. If you're giving more time to theater and entertainment than you are giving to God Almighty, are you giving him time? You see where it becomes a God in our lives and what's taking our time away. And it's beginning to take our time more and more. I remember as a children's pastor in, in Lodi. And there was a school there, a Christian school. And I had some people come to me and ask me about what I thought about parents were keeping their kids out of school, help them out of school so they could go and see the newest Harry Potter movie and be the first ones in their class to see it. Did I see a problem with that? It's like... <laughs> Do you have to ask? <laughs> Is it more important that you're the first kid? I mean, they could have gone after school and see it, but they, they kept their kids out of school so that they could be the first ones in their class to see a movie about the occult. Yeah. Now, to be honest, are the Harry Potter, Potter movies entertaining? Sure they are. But they're not good for the kids. The kids are the age that were being taken to school. Their parents were saying, this is more important to you than your Christian school. So what message does that give them? The message they should have been getting is, you know, this is all fiction and used as a stepping board to teach about what real witchcraft and things are, that this is evil, what, this is not, this is just being portrayed for fun and entertainment, but the real thing is bad. I mean, you can use it to teach your kids, but do it outside of taking them out of school because when you do that, you're telling them what's more important. Then there's Plutus. The god of wealth in ancient Greek, religion and myth. People today, some people worship wealth. 
Their pursuit is to get more of it. If you're a workaholic, you need to ask yourself, am I worshiping Plutus? Is my wealth becoming more important to me than my family, my church? We have to be careful. Now, there are some times when work keeps us out of church. That's okay, but it shouldn't keep you out every week, once in a while. You know, I had to put my foot down when I took a job once about working on Sunday. I got a job in a jewelry store at Sunrise Mall. I was a jeweler at one time. You don't know that. That's what I did for many years. And the manager of the chain was a Jewish man. And they told me, because I told them when they were first interviewing me, they said, you know, you're going to go and interview um, Sylvan. He's in charge of this whole section, and, and he's going to want you to work on Sunday. Your manager was saying, I don't have a problem, because he was a Christian. But he said, but they're going to require you to do that. So when I sat down with him, I told him, I said, I can work every day except Sunday. Because I, got, I teach Sunday school, and I need to go to church. And he said, oh, okay, that's no problem. And then the rest of the store found they couldn't believe it. He's going to let you not work on Sunday? I said, I said yeah, I just told him when I, I needed to go to church. You know, like, they didn't ever thought of doing that. <laughs> One time, they made a, they had a special, they ran it in the paper where there's a coupon that you could come in on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and get a, a free ring sizing. Well, I was the jeweler. They needed me there to size the rings. And Sylvan personally came to the store. He didn't often come to the store, and he asked me, he said, I want to apologize, first of all. I forgot that you can't work on Sunday. And this coupon said, he said, uh, is there any way you can come after church? I said, sure, I can come. I said, I, I get done. I said, I teach Sunday school. I'll come after Sunday school and make an exception. He goes, no, no. When, when are you done with going to church? And I said, well, I'm not done until noon. He said, well, if you can get here by one, that would be fine. We'll just tell people to wait. But why? Because I told him I couldn't do it. And he understood that. You see, sometimes we work on Sunday because we don't put our foot down. We don't tell the boss, I can't do it. Because think of the message that gives to the boss. Don't start thinking about it. Well, maybe I shouldn't be working. You know, remember when stores weren't open on Sunday? Anybody that old? Some are older than me. And we all survived. We survived. I remember as a kid, I hated it. We'd get out of church and nothing was open. And I remember in Carmichael, there was a hobby store, and we'd drive by it coming home from church, and they started getting opening at 1 o'clock on Sundays. They waited until church was done, and I was so excited because we could bug Dad to pull into the... Because you know, there weren't any other days of the week. We were in, all in the car with him and driving by. <coughs> and so once in a while, he'd stop and we'd go in. But it was after church because it didn't open until 1 o'clock. But that's changed so much now. Not only are everything open on Sunday, but there's almost this, they almost demand you to be there, put the sales on Sunday. It's just, things have changed. Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Money. Can't serve both. You have to serve one or the other. Then there's the God of athletics. Hermes, he is viewed as the protector and patron of literature, poetry, athletics, and sports. When they had the Olympic Games in Greece, they all gave offerings to Hermes because they worshipped him as the protector of the god of sports and athletics. 1 Timothy 4, 8, 9 says, For the body, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having Promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. So what Paul is telling Timothy is exercise profits a little. But godliness profits for all things. Because a lot of people use the argument, well, i got to have my kids in sports. It's good exercise for them. Exercise profits a little. What is the message we're sending? Some of you have probably forgotten the story of Eric Henry Liddell. Any of you remember the movie, the book Chariots of Fire? He was a Scottish athlete 
rug rugby union international player and missionary who chose his religious beliefs over, his, over competing in an Olympic race held on a Sunday. At the 1924 Summer Olympics in Paris, Liddell refused to run in the heats for his favored 100 meters because they were held on a Sunday. Instead, he competed in the 400 meter held on a weekday, a race that he won. The story of Liddell is he was an Olympic runner. His best race was the 100 meters. He was the one that everybody knew was going to win the gold medal. He had worked his life to win a gold medal at the Olympics. And then when he got there, he found out his race was on Sunday. So what did he do? Refused to run the race. How many people do that today? What an example. Instead, he ran the 400 meters, which was not a race he was expected to win because it was a much longer distance. He was a sprinter, not a distance runner. But he ran the 400 meters, and guess what? He won. God honored him. You don't know that Liddell went on to be a missionary in China. And he died in a Japanese internment camp during the war. Great man of God stood up for what he believed in. That's an example we need to learn. We should get that movie back out. I know we got the music from Chariots of Fire played at our wedding when we were walking out. It was a great song. We didn't run out. <coughs> Is it more important to not let down your team or not let down God? A lot of people say, well, i got to go play on Sunday. i got to play my sport because I don't want to let down my team. But who are you letting down? God. Letting down God. Maybe you should be more of an example to your team. If you didn't go on those games that were on Sunday, that might speak something to them. Or maybe you could take that opportunity and be a missionary to that team. See, I'd have less problem with people missing church on Sunday for sports if I found out they had a ministry at their sporting game and that they were gathering the kids together between the games and having a prayer service with them, reading them some scripture, giving them a lesson. But how many people are doing that? It would be a great ministry. You know, it really, you're going to say, hey, sports is important, but so is God. Well, then take and make it a ministry. I remember, my wife will tell you, when we got married, what, what was my favorite sport? Uh, NASCAR racing. Auto racing. Not necessarily just NASCAR, but auto racing. I drove my wife to the races. <laughs> Loved especially the Indy race, car races at Laguna Seca. They're always on Sunday. We went to one race, and we were determined we were going to go to church. They announced there was a church service, and I always prayed and said, Lord, that's the ministry I want. <laughs> Give me a ministry at the auto races. And I could have a car and I could race and then you know do services. And I we gave it to somebody else. Message to this day. And yeah, didn't ever, I haven't forgot the message. But we had to go through all these barriers to get to church on Sunday morning. They announced that it was open to the public. But we'd go up to the gates in a restricted area and they look at us and go, we're trying to go to church. And the guy looked at us like we we're you know, crazy. No, they said they announced that we go. Oh, man real reluctantly let us in. There was another girl with us as we're going through this and she finally looks at us and goes, boy, it's hard to be a Christian at the race. <laughs> there were about three different barriers we had to go through to get in the room because in the room where the service was with all these drivers that were Christians were in the service. Uh -huh. And like I said, haven't forgot the message. It was on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And when the minister got to the part where it says, I see through a mirror darkly. I see in a mirror darkly. He says, now that's like going down the track at over 100 miles an hour and your windshield's covered with oil. <laughs> I thought, boy, I never thought of it like that. He says, you're not seeing the whole picture. <laughs> but it was a good enough, we have never forgotten that. But part of that is because the church that we attended, the pastor told his staff that if they went on vacation, they had to bring a bulletin from the church that they attended. <laughs> And we weren't required to do that, but we worked in the children's department. We felt like, oh, maybe, you know, he might ask sometime. If we were. So we'd always grab a bulletin whenever we went somewhere to a church. But even when you're on vacation, find a church. Sometimes you're really blessed. And not only that, you know what? You're a blessing to that church. Especially if you're up in the mountains or in an out-of-way place, and that little church there on the corner hardly ever gets any visitors. And you walk, it's like a really, real blessing. Just like when we get visitors come in that are visiting the area. I take that as a blessing. 
So bless the church in there. It doesn't take much time now, but I worship God. Now here are some checkpoints to help you evaluate your heart in relation to organized sports. Some questions we can ask. Will my commitment to sports have a negative effect on my commitment to God and my local church? Do my children see me more committed to sports than God? If you're taking your children and saying it's more important to go play their game than to go to church without making church part of that event, aren't you, isn't that what you're telling them? That the sports are more important? Do I honor God with my family's involvement in organized sports? Again, there's ways to honor God if you're involved. Honor Him by making it your ministry. And then I have people, people say, well, you know, this is a good way to reach the lost. But then you go and see them at the game and they're just sitting in the crowd cheering their kids on and you don't see them witnessing to anybody. So how are you saving the lost? Confused. You're telling the lost that it's okay to go play your game and stay away from church. Not that church saves anybody. I don't want anybody get me wrong. You don't get saved coming to church. We come to church because the Bible says we need each other. That's what keeps us strong. We need each other. Do I use my involvement in organized sports as an outreach opportunity to share the gospel? Do I get more joy from sports than I do from God? You get more joy going to the game than going to the church? Now, you should get joy out of learning from God's Word, from worshiping Him. That, if that's not giving you joy, then let's figure out what we need to do. Is it the wrong song? Is it the wrong message? We should get some inner joy and peace and comfort from God's Word and being with other Christians. Those are things that, questions that you can ask and ask yourself, are you making sports more important than church? And the reason I focus on this one a little more is this is a huge problem in America today. When I was young, again, you know, giving away my age, <laughs> but they didn't play sports on Sundays. There was a reason they didn't have Little League games on Sunday. Very simple reason, because nobody would go. If they put a game on Sunday, most of the team wouldn't be there, because they were in church. Then, when soccer became popular, they said that because the fields weren't available on the other weekdays, they started playing them on Sunday. But you know, the seasons are different. And a lot of times I see empty fields on other weekdays, you know, there's, there's ways around that. But I think it was just a, a slow, subtle attack on the church. Was it deliberate, openly? No, I believe in a spiritual conspiracy that's behind the scenes. Right. They're using these things against God's people. But God's people need to learn to stand up. How can we change it? Stop going. Guess what? Yeah. They don't want to lose money for their sports. They don't want to lose their leagues. They're going to change the days that they play. But we don't stand up. That's a problem. Luke 18, verse 8, second half. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The question that Jesus asked. When he comes back, is he going to find any faith left on the earth? We keep going the way we're going. <laughs> They're not going to be a lot. And unfortunately, that's what we find out when we read through the end of the Bible. Again, it's a remnant that is saved. But a large portion of the earth is going to be destroyed because people are turning from God. So why do I bother to speak out on things sometimes that are uncomfortable to hear about? I don't like to do it. My wife said, sometimes, you know, you should be careful about giving reviews of a movie or, or talking about what's going on in the politics because people don't want to always hear the negative. But the Bible says that as a teacher, I am held accountable if I don't warn you. If you get mad at me, I guess I just have to put up with that. But I don't like always, but we live in a day and age where it's almost weekly that there's something that needs to be warned about from the pulpit. The feel-good message, while it'll build big churches, is leaving people ill-prepared when they go and see things that don't teach what the Bible teaches to know that they're not being taught correctly, they're told correctly. That's why I spend so much time in study. 
drives my wife crazy. But I at least 40 hours a week studying for part of it is just trying to get God's word what to teach on and then part of it then is trying to figure out how to present it. It's not an easy thing, but something I love. That's why God called me into this ministry as a teacher. Not everybody loves to do that. Another thing people are worshiping today is Mother Earth. For the Greeks, the earth goddess is Gaia. For the Polynesian, the earth goddess is Papa. Maybe that sounds familiar to some of you. It says, this is an article about Al Gore, the United Nations, and the cult of Gaia. The U.S. taxpayers are being forced to subsidize a new form of state religion which holds that natural resources have to be protected for the sake of Gaia. Remember, that's the Greek god of the earth. A so-called earth spirit. The idea behind this is people like Al Gore and people that are really extreme environmentalists believe that the earth is a living entity. And that when we abuse natural resources and things, we are affecting this living entity called Gaia. This religious movement, which has cult-like qualities, is being promoted by leading figures and organizations such as Vice President Albert Gore, broadcaster Ted Turner in the United Nations. Gore, who, as a member of the U.S. Senate, participated in the 1992 U.N.-sponsored Earth Summit. Gore has written openly about the Earth having, a sacred, having sacred qualities, and he has praised primitive pagan religions and goddess worship. Because he said, oh, it's good for the Earth. Well, as Christians, should we worship the Earth? No, we shouldn't. Should we be concerned about the environment? Yes, we should. But there's a difference. We don't, you know, recycle and do these things because we're worried about damaging Mother Earth. We do it because God says that we're to be stewards of what he gave us. We need to look at the Earth. This is God's creation. He created it for us. And we need to be careful how we take care of it. But we should never put the needs of the Earth above the needs of man. Even when it comes to natural resources, if, if mankind needs the resources for survival, you don't, you know, protect that and then let man starve. Mm -hmm. A lot of times things like that are being done because of, for the sake of um, some little fish or something. In, in California, it's a snail darter. It's a little fish that nobody even knows what it is. But our farmers are not being given the water they need to grow food that we need to eat. Yeah. And there are people starving in parts of the world, and they're not being given the water to protect this little minnow. I know it's only part. It's just a small part of it, but it goes grows from there. See, we got to be careful that we're not worshiping the earth. Man is more important to God than the earth is. You know why? Because God can make a new earth very easily. In fact, that's what he's going to do. He says he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to put it back the way it was supposed to be in the Garden of Eden. There was plenty of food, plenty of resources. And a lot of people say that, you know, there's, the earth is overpopulated. And it's funny, I was watching a show last night on Fox, I having a discussion, and one of them said, well, people that think the earth is overpopulated need to get in an airplane and fly, fly from New York to California. Exactly. And look down. Most of what you fly over, there's nothing there. And then you see these little cities and spots where, you know, we were never supposed to accumulate in cities. God said to spread out to be fruitful and multiply. He never meant for mankind to accumulate into cities. But that's what we've done, and that's why there's so much sin and violence and problems, because when you crowd people together, they begin to fight for space and resources, and sin spreads much quicker. Well, I like living in the country. Seems to be a little less of that going on around you. I know people, I won't say who, because I don't want you to know, but that have no problem never locking their doors and sleeping at night with their screen door wide open, no lock on it. Absolutely not afraid because of where they live. 
you know, I'll tell you who, we got somebody going, <laughs> taking something from those people. That's not my wife. I walk outside sometimes and get something around the yard, come walking back and the door's locked. <laughs> my wife likes locked doors, that's okay. We, we grew up in the city. <laughs> he forgets to unlock the handle before he goes out. Oh. I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> there have been times where I have unlocked it and gone out and I was out for a while and she comes back in the house and she the whole <laughs> Oh, I didn't know you were outside. It's okay though, we grew up in the city. You locked your doors in the city. <laughs> it's a different environment. We were talking about the other day that, you know, about I need to get more exercise. Because I'm having trouble walking a lot because of problems with my foot. But because of my lack of exercise, my blood sugar is hard to control. I need exercise. That's why I said, I, and she mentioned we had a bicycle. I said, remember when we had bicycles? <laughs> we went and both bought these new bicycles when we lived in Carmichael. I think we rode them a couple times around the neighborhood. And one day I was mowing the lawn and I left the garage door open and I was in the back mowing the back lawn, came back and one of the bikes was gone. A few weeks later, same thing, the garage door hit something, went out, didn't know it was open, went outside, saw the garage door open, the other bike was gone. If whoever took the first one knew there was a second one. We've never had bikes since. So she said, we need to look at garage sales and get me a new bike. Because now where I live, I'm not as worried about it. I don't see people wandering up our driveway. <laughs> so it'd be a good form of exercise. But the point there is we're not to worship nature. We're not to worship sports. We're not to worship money. There are many idols in America that people are worshiping. We need to destroy the idols and get back to the living God. His word, it says, is alive sharper than any two-edged sword. Everything we need to filter through God's Word. If there's ever any question, if you see something, read something, or told something, or somebody shares something with you and it doesn't sound quite right, filter it through God's Word. If your computer's savvy at all, it's so easy today to do that. Get on there and use Google. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> but don't spend too much time on YouTube <laughs> unless you're listening to some good biblical teaching but always when you Google something you go to somebody's website or something you read their teaching even filter that through God's word yeah. that's why it takes me so long sometimes to read some of the books I read though they're books written about scripture every time they refer to a scripture I and I like my Kindle because I can immediately go, you know, my electronic book, I go right over to my Bible, look up that verse and read it. So I'm constantly going back and forth. Because I'm going, okay, just because this author says that this is how this is, I want to read it in context. Like, oh, okay, I'll do it. So I spend a lot of time in a book doing that. You should do that with every sermon I get. If something doesn't sound right, jot it down and go look it up. Get your Bible out, look it up. That's what the Bereans did. We need to be like the Bereans in the book of Acts. It said they studied the word of God daily to see if the things they were being told were true. But we don't do that anymore. Be a Berean. Look in your Bibles to see if those things are true. If you need to get one of these topical indexes for your Bible where you can look up a specific topic and it'll list all the uh, verses that pertain to that topic. If you don't know how to find them, those are easy, those are great tools. If you'd like me to find one for you, I'll find one for you. But a good topical index is something good to have. Mm -hmm. um, again, with technology, on my computer, I have a great Bible program that has all those helps. I can go to the the topical index. I can search words. I can so I can get it up really quickly. But it is God's word. I can go to the original language and see what the words were. Good study aid. So technology is not bad if we use it right. But let's not worship our technology. Try to keep your phones off when you come to church. You know what? Your friends will be there when you leave. And so will the messages they send you. So let's bow our heads. If you're here today and you're struggling with any of the gods that we brought into America. 
If you don't know the God of the Bible, today is a day that you can enter into a relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus. It says nobody comes to the Father except through Him. If you need to receive Jesus today, let me include you in my closing prayer by flipping your hand up. If you're struggling with an idol in your life and you want pray, prayer, that God will help you. Put your hand up for a second so I can include you in my prayer. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for those that are honest, Lord. Lord, I, I also say that I struggle at times with giving too much time to things other than you. Lord, we all want a closer relationship with you. And I pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would draw us in. That you would convict us when we need to spend time with you. That you would wake us up when we need to get to church. That you would give us such a hunger for your word, Lord, that we couldn't stay away. Because it's in your word, Lord, that we get to know you. We thank you that you preserved it through history and you brought it to us, Lord, that we still have your written word. Your word is not dead but alive. Sharper than a two-edged sword that can cut to the marrow. It means you can cut out all those things in our life that don't belong there. Help us to be people of your word. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be like the Bereans, that we would question everything by opening your word and seeing if what it, we're being told or what we're saying is, is according to your word. We thank you for that, Jesus. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. I ask you to go with us and bless us, Lord, in your wonderful name. Amen.